What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 337. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me <laughs> on my bed <laughs> of the hotel room, it's Luis Scott Vargas, LSV. Hi. Uh, yeah, things are going well. Even I didn't ask how you were doing. I was going, but <laughs> I was I, going to. I do want to point out that recording limited resources while lying down is is much more comfortable. So would you I, call it a killer app? Or? It is the killer app. So I might have to look into doing that next time. So Luis and I are uh, together. We're doing coverage of the Magic Online Championship in in my hometown in Seattle, but we're at the the hotel where the uh, coverage is being filmed. And uh, yeah, Luis is anyway. He's on my bed. <laughs> He's also clipped the microphone that I gave him to the bed rather than to his shirt. And I think that's actually going to work pretty well, though. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so, because I'm not changing it. <laughs> so um, this show, we're going to talk about Seal Deck. We like to talk about Seal Deck once per set, uh, specifically about that set, because we know how important Seal Deck is to you, the listener, uh, as that is in many ways the way that you play limited uh, in a tournament environment is going to at least start with seal deck, whether it's a, a Grand Prix or, you know, a PPTQ, something like that. You, you're going to be playing sealed and... Uh, or an RPTQ. Or an RPTQ. And, you know, the difference between draft and sealed is it's different enough that we, we feel like we should devote a show to it for each one. We're going to be doing that. Before we get into it, I want to mention our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. Pretty excited about this one, Luis. Um... Limited resources, sleeves, and deck boxes are back in stock. That's right. Uh, Channel Fireball had a full run of these made. What are you reading? The show notes. Please say that's the show notes. The show notes. I'll take that phone from you. <laughs> you have no First idea. First of all, I would never read other things than, <laughs> rather than the show notes. Well, I thought maybe you were looking up limited resources, sleeves, and deck boxes on Channel Fireball. I have, in fact. Those are available now, uh, as well as LR hoodies. Wait, no, those are mm, those are specially don't made. Don't do that. And I, I have one. I, I wear it on stream all the time. And people ask you. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, I had just a few of those made. Uh, I'm not sure if I can do those in a bigger scale. I'm looking into it. But anyway... Sleeves and deck boxes. I know that uh, you guys, the faithful limited resources listeners, have been asking me uh, for a long time, where can I get these? Because they've been sold out and gone for quite a while. Well, they're back. Uh, thanks to Channel Fireball, they got a nice big order of them in, and you can find them uh, on Channel Fireball right now. Uh, I made sure that the deck box was big enough to hold uh, a Commander deck or a Canadian Highlander deck if you were into that. And uh, the sleeves come in packages of 50. It really should have the deck box should have had forty five cards in it. it. It should have been able to hold a limited deck plus a couple sideboard options. Yeah, I think the original one kind of did, but I, I actually said no. I, I like this bigger one a little no, better. It's actually better. Dude. Yeah, I, I think it's better that way. Anyway, um, while you're there, awesome free content at Channel Fireball. You can find articles by some of the best players in the world. You can find videos, podcasts like this one, all for free every day over at Channel Fireball. Also, the Patreon. You can support the show directly via the Patreon, and uh, this is. You know, the way that if, if you want to to give back to the show, if you feel like you've gotten value from the show, um, this is a way that you can give back. You get a free, not free, so you get a thank you card for signing up. No matter what level you sign up for, you can do a dollar a show. It doesn't matter. And if you go up the ranks a little bit, you can even get some cool perks. Um, and one of them, of course, is that you are eligible to submit questions for the question of the week. This one comes from Austin Cook otherwise known as Patriot Fan 09. I always tell him he's a monster in the chat because, well, I'm a Seahawks fan and he's a Patriots fan. Uh, he says, hey, Marshall and Luis, big fan. Uh, my next regional PTQ is limited. It's SOI sealed, which had me wondering, how do you prepare for bigger competitive sealed tournaments? And he'd love uh, some tips to keep in mind during deck building uh, for, the, for the Swiss rounds. And he also has a follow-up question for you, Luis, that I'll ask you after we address his initial question. It's, so, not, it's not as much a follow-up question as the actual question. The, the rest is just setting kind of the preamble. Okay. Well, we'll save the actual question for last, and we'll, we'll get the preamble out of the way. So we're going to be talking about the intricacies of Shadows Over Innistrad uh, sealed as, as it compares to draft. But I think that this question can be taken pretty uh, generally as well, which is how do you prepare for bigger competitive sealed tournaments? Um, you know, for you specifically, uh, you know, that would be a Grand Prix uh, since sealed isn't played at the at the Pro Tour level. Um, you just jam a bunch of them? Do you, do you open pools, build decks, but don't actually play the games just to get a feel for it? What, what do you recommend? The, this answer used to be a lot different before leagues on Magic Online. Right now, I think leagues are just by far the best way to prepare for a sealed tournament. You can 
You can join a league. Uh, the competitive five-match sealed is really what you're looking for if you want to test for a, a tournament. The, the, the nine-match sealed with different stages where you open packs is, is certainly a reasonable thing to do, too. But if you want to test actual tournament conditions, the, the five-match competitive leagues on Magic Online, they're good because you can build a couple different decks, and they're all saved in the same interface, where you can just switch decks in between games or in between rounds pretty easily. And you get to build sealed decks. I mean, the best way to practice sealed is to build sealed decks and play matches of sealed. Uh, <laughs> I, I will admit, I, I join sealed leagues and then like sometimes just don't finish them because I want to build a new sealed deck. But I, <laughs> for, for those who love value, that's not actually that's the best spewy. way. It's a little spewy. Yeah, it's it's. But that's just uh, also. I mean, if you if you watch my stream, that gets they do that all the time. I've, yeah. Two O dropped them from drafts. But look, we're we're not here to learn about that. We're here to learn about how to practice for sealed tournaments. And besides the the actual sealed strategy which we'll get to later i think that practicing uh, in that way is good you can also practice with your friends i know before some of the team sealed grand prix i uh, uh since those are a little harder to practice for online i have just opened sealed decks and played against like one person or whatever for example just one one v one uh people people i know yeah and you can do that with normal seals too you yeah can... i was gonna say something similar i uh, agree 100 percent about leagues if you play on magic online but if you don't uh, if Magic Online isn't available to you or, or you don't play on it, one one really nice way to get a lot of value is like you can buy maybe a booster box worth uh, of packs or maybe not even a full booster box. But if you get a booster box, what you can do is you can take uh, the booster pack and immediately sleeve it. And you can mark the sleeve with like, say, one on the somewhere on it. It doesn't matter where because you're not going to play these uh, in, a, in a competitive environment. And you do that with each of the booster packs. Now, this is a little time consuming. Sleeving up basically a box of, of cards is, is going to take you a little while. But once you do that, as long as you can differentiate each of them, then you're going to have basically reproducible booster packs. So you randomize the pack itself. Like, and what I mean is like pack one, pack two, pack three, and you'll have up to pack 36. And you take six of them at random and then you build a sealed pool from that. And you'll get a chance to feel out how the sealed pool, how the pool works, what the strengths was, worth, what the weaknesses were. And then you put the packs back in pack groupings and then you take six random packs again. And this lets you build multiple sealed pools from one booster box and you could build 10, 20, 30 and never have the same configuration. You know, you won't have the same configuration if you're, if you're picking them randomly. So that's just a way to get some, some extra legs out of like a box without having to buy like a case just to do a bunch of seals. Well, in that vein, you can also use uh, online sealed deck generators. I remember for yeah. um, Modern Masters, for example, since that was a, a set that uh, we had the set list a, lo- a ways before we actually had the packs. Practicing for the Modern Masters Grand Prix, I would just use sealed deck generators and just get, get card lists and now, just keep d- doing that. And, and so we're... we're but do you trust the the packs because of the collation stuff? I figure it's Do you close not put enough. that much into it? Close enough? Okay. Yeah, Cuz that is a that if, is a thing. If you get 3 of the same common or you get like a common run that doesn't exist, that doesn't that doesn't really change the overall results. Okay. Uh, and then the <laughs> apparently very important follow-up question. He says also, how do you handle getting as unlucky as Luis does? Yeah, the concept of luck is one that's very interesting to me. Uh, it impacts as a connoisseur of bad luck. It yeah, I I, 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 <laughs> I savor the good luck, but you know, I'm, I'm used to the bad luck. Basically, I, I have an interesting relationship with luck, where luck certainly exists as, exists as a concept. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you can't say that it doesn't. I, I don't believe. I don't believe people are intrinsically luckier before the events occur. Like, it's not like I, I think, like, I'm lucky or unlucky, mm-hmm. and, I, and I won't repeat that necessarily because I am unlucky. But, no, you know, like, if, I, if, I, if I'm going to open a booster pack, I don't believe I'm intrinsically lucky or unlucky because I don't think that makes sense. But post-event, you can, de- you can try to determine how lucky or unlucky you've gotten. I mean, dealing with luck is, is a challenge. One of the things magic does best is it teaches you to deal with luck and variance and get used to it because – you deal with it so much when you play games of magic that it kind of, you know, inures you to it. You're, you're a little invulnerable to it. That way, I don't know, I found when I get unlucky in other aspects of life, when something bad happens, it's a lot easier for me to shrug it off because it's happened so much in magic. Yeah, that happened to me uh, for poker. I, you know, it used to really sting me when I when something that was not a high probability would happen. And man, I... I you kind of get it beaten out of you at some point. Oh, yeah. And it's weird because it sounds defeatist, and it happens in Magic. It definitely happened to me in poker, but at some point, you start to expect to lose. And I don't mean to expect to lose every time, but you start to accept expect the fact that 
you know, 20%, 30% of the time, you're going to lose this. And that you're going to feel that more than the 80 or 70% of the time that you win. But well, it's really psychologically great to be able to be okay with that ahead of time. That, well, that's how I feel. It's just building your, you know, you're building up your mental muscles there. Right. Be- and, and the way I see it is if you get really pissed every time you get unlucky and lose, you're either going to stop playing Magic or you're going to get over it. Right. And those are, they're not a whole – I mean some deranged individuals just keep playing Magic and keep getting pissed. But I don't understand really <laughs> really how that ends up happening. So for the most part, I would say that uh, dealing with luck is a really important skill when you have to get used to. Uh, otherwise, you know, what are you doing here? Yeah. So take that. That's a real answer it was to your question, a real Patriot answer. Man. Take that. <laughs> Okay, um, let's do our cracker pack now. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I, I actually forgot to grab a pack from home before taking off uh, to come down here for for coverage. So what I've done is I made a sacrifice to the value gods on behalf of the listeners. I opened up a booster pack for my account on Magic Online for no value. Don't look. <laughs> I have it on my screen. Louise can't see it. So here we go. Opening sound. Mm, that, that smells was, good. That was a terrible job of Unru- the opening sound. Unruly Mob. Unruly Mob is not a card I'm looking to no. first pick or really play in most of my decks. Uh, yeah, no, it didn't really seem to find much of It was good on. in original Innistrad. It's less good here. Uh, Uncaged Fury. So the plus plus one double strike yeah. trick, which yeah, it's, it's a dangerous card, card but yeah. not, not an early pick. No. Uh, Stoic Builder. Still not an early pick. I mean, he can be pretty bananas when you get a lot of ways to put lands in your graveyard, but for the most part, I'm not taking him early. Yeah. This next one, high power level in the right situation, but I think it still fits that same description. Senseless Rage. Yeah. It's uh, the Madness plus two plus two or uh, Again, these are all cards that can slot into existing decks, but they're not cards you kick off a deck with. And in that same vein, Sanitarium Skeleton. I was going to say Alms of the Vein, because that, that would have been no. exactly in the same vein. Uh, so yes, yeah, <laughs> Sanitarium Skeleton. Sanitarium Skeleton has a slight distinction in that some decks want it incredibly badly and will go out of their way to get it, but again, it's still not an early pick. Uh, Niblis of Dusk. This one doesn't fit directly into only one strategy, but it's also just not a high power level No, card. the 2 one Prowess Flyer was a... Again, we've mentioned this before. Jeskout Winscout was a pretty satisfactory third pick uh, in Konzentark here and pretty mediocre card in this format. Yeah. It just doesn't line up right. It hasn't. Uh, wow, we're kind of on a roll. Maybe this is telling us something about the format. Moldgraf Scavenger. Yeah, Another the, card that goes well in a certain deck, but that you're not first picking. I mean, of all these cards... I guess I'm first picking Moldgraf Scavenger, but I'm not. I'm super wow. unhappy about it. Maybe yeah. I would take the Niblis. Like yeah. they're both pretty bad. They're both bad. Uh, here's Crow of Dark Tidings. This All right. Is well, this is our current the Niblis, yeah. front runner. I think the Crow has enough synergies and is just solid by itself. Um, all right. So we've got four uncommons. Okay. So our double face card is Village Messenger. The one one the uh, haste that flips into a two two menace for one red. Uh, not. A card I'm unhappy with in like a dedicated werewolf or aggressive deck, but still I think worse than Crow of Dark Tidings. I think so too, on average for sure. And then, you know, I just mentioned a pack run thing. I've seen this one a lot of times. This is Moonlight Hunt sitting right next to Howl Pack Resurgence. Yeah, it's actually funny that those two cards are, I assume, intentionally put together because they both go in the same deck. And I, I don't really want to first pick either, though I guess if I had to choose between one of the two, I would rather take Halpak Resurgence. I would too. In a deck that wants to play these cards, Halpak's just much, much better. It's, but I, yeah. I still am just going to take Crow of Dark Tidings first. You're going to change your mind in a couple of minutes. Uh, Essence Flux. It's going to take us a couple minutes to get through this pack? Uh, no, it'll it, 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 it'll be really soon. <laughs> right. Essence Flux. Well, we're still not taking Essence Flux. Ex- exile target creature. You control and return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If it's a spirit, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. Oh, I, that, I now seen... that you read the card... Still you still don't like it, right. All right. Which rare should I read first? Our Mythic Rare or our not Mythic Rare? Uh, I don't know. It surprised me. They're both awesome. All this right. is actually a really interesting one, although I think I know what the pick is. So our Mythic Rare is Arlen Cord. Okay. The Red Green Werewolf yeah. Flip Planeswalker. She's quite good. She's very, very good. She makes 2-2 two, two Wolf. She makes your creatures bigger. Yeah, and she makes 2-2 two, two Wolf, and... then flips, then deals 3 damage, then flips, and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, somehow, though, we I think that our rare is actually just better. I think it's actually a lot better. It's always watching. 
Oh yeah, so always watching is much better. This is the one white white enchantment that gives all your non-token creatures plus plus one vigilance. Yeah, I mean it's not every day that you open up a planeswalker and and you know a pretty decent one like Arlen Court and then just say, oh no, I'm not taking that. Here. And I don't think this, per- yeah, like you said, this isn't particularly close. Always yeah. watching is not only mono colored but just a much much better card. If you just have an always watching in play, all your creatures just get so much better than your opponents. It's crazy how good that card is. It's weird too because reading it, you know, the the real thing is the vigilance, right? Like that. I mean the Plus one, plus one is the most important part. Um, but, you know, I've played with these type of effects in Limited before. And while they're always quite strong, you know, I don't know. I think without the Vigilance, I might might look at a little closer at Arlen Cord. But for some reason, always watching just makes it feel impossible to, to you know, trump your opponent's sport. Yeah, I, I agree. Without the Vigilance, I, I think that I would just completely win most slam always watching that wouldn't be close <laughs> <laughs> would you really though like oh, is yeah. one white white plus one plus one all your creatures that much better than arlen court it is i believe it, it's just so good i have it a lot closer put it that way because well, vigilance isn't that important to if me, arlen court was like mono green right if she costs two yeah. green green yeah then that would be a little closer but know, even the then always the, what i know even then, always watching yeah. is just it will stack up too well even yeah. without vigilance i don't want to be on this side of the fight anyway i'm slamming always watching all right yeah. well we, we've always watched all right, so there's our, our crack a pack. Now, I want to get into. So we've got kind of a mishmash of topics for sealed deck. Basically, uh, you and I sat down with Kenji, and I just threw a bunch of you know kind of Numa brainstorming. Nummy. Yeah, New Month and Nummy. He's doing coverage with us here, uh, and we just threw a whole bunch of, of ideas out off of each other, and I just took a bunch of notes. I was thinking, but I was lying down for that too. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you never take it lying down, but you do, I guess. Um, so let's just start going through some of these points because. Like I said, I, I don't think that there's, um, you know, I don't think there's one big LSV's key to this format. It's more like, you know, a bunch of things that you need to consider. And let's, so let's just start going through some of them. So one of them that, that came to mind immediately for, for all three of us was well, that... And I think this is the most important point. This is like the, the overarching point. So the highly synergistic slash tribal is, is often uh, how that's expressed in, in this format. These decks don't come together as often as they do in draft. Now, the point here, right, like th- there's something that's worth clarifying here, is that what we're not saying is that the synergy decks are bad or even worse in sealed. It's just that they're harder to get, right? I mean, there's a big difference between these decks suck in sealed and you just won't see them as often. So the best example of this is uh, Battle for Zendikar. So remember back to Battle for Zendikar where Green was widely heralded as the worst color in draft. And I think it was pretty unanimous or mm-hmm. pretty close to unanimous that people were like, yeah, green's really bad. Mm-hmm. Some people, I remember we had uh, Owen Turnwall on as a guest and he advocated never drafting green. Mm-hmm. And that might have been a, a little extreme, but it was certainly an interesting episode. Yeah, I actually would recommend that episode. Yeah, if you and, and to he one. knew he was being extreme. Like yeah. he was owning it, you know, so that was but, a... But, but even like, setting aside the, the minutia of the format, it, w- it was accepted. Green was very, very bad. Often people would ask me, does that mean green is really bad in sealed too? It's like, no, it absolutely doesn't. And the reason that it isn't is the reason green is bad in draft is that you you couldn't first pick a green card and have confidence you'd end up with enough green cards or powerful enough green cards. Whereas in sealed, you just have all that information. You can determine whether green is good or bad. And in fact, sealed green was quite playable in Battle for Zendikar Sealed. It's similar in Shadows over Innistrad where synergy decks are great in draft and they're a lot of what drives the format. It's not that they're bad in sealed. It's that you'll just look at your sealed pool and you'll see like, oh, I've got a rise from the tides and I have six playable spells total. Clearly this card's not playable. Or I've got three madness cards and one madness enabler, so I can't really build a deck around this. So we aren't saying that you can't build a synergy deck. I've had sealed decks. Like I had a sealed deck that had two green vessels, a crawling sensation, an epitaph golem, and a, a you know fork in the road. And I was like, okay, this is a pretty good start to a delirium deck. But... Most sealeds are just not going to have that level of depth when it comes to their synergies, so you just can't build the synergy decks. It's not that you are you shouldn't if the cards are there. If the cards are there, build them, by all means. But yeah. we're, our, our experience in sealed is that you just aren't going to have all the tools necessary, at least not compared to draft. Yeah, and you know the reason why we bring this up as a point of clarification is because... You know, one of the things that's generally true of Seal, though not it doesn't hold a 100% record, but is, you know, the faster, leaner, more aggressive decks... Uh, tend to be worse, right? They just yeah. tend to generally be worse in sealed deck. Well, that means that even if you open up what you would think, you know, would be a good sealed, de- a good aggressive sealed deck, you probably should try to veer away from it because that strategy isn't going to do well. 
The difference here is that if you open up a good synergy deck, play it. Like it right. will be good here. It's just you're not going to do that as often. So you need to, you can't rely on that aspect of your knowledge of the format to get you through sealed because it's just not going to pop up that often. Right. And this is the biggest difference between the two formats. I think one of the, one of the common mistakes people make when it comes to sealed, and I, I've made this mix so many times, is that, oh, I've done a lot of drafts of this format. I understand what each card is worth. I'll just play some. I'll play sealed, and it'll be fine. And I've gone to sealed tournaments, having played zero to two sealeds, and you know, not done as well as I think I could have. Right. And one of the biggest differences is that the delta, the difference between draft and sealed, is what we're trying to get at. And the biggest difference is that the format just looks different. If you approach Shadows of Nistra draft with the mentality of like, hey, this is, I'll just try to draft some good cards and see how, and see how that works out, you're, you're going to get trounced, as a lot of people have found out. That that's not what the format's about. The format is about synergy and all these linear decks. If you approach sealed that way, it's actually a lot closer to correct. So if you go from draft to sealed, you have to adjust your expectations. Yeah, you know, going back to the battle for Zenikar, remember Broodhunter Worm? Oh, yep. Three and a green for a 4-3. Which everybody, including us in the set review, were thinking, like, that's fine. Right? Yeah. Like, it's not it's not an exciting card, but yeah, I'll play a 4-3 for four mana. That beats down. It's okay. And it ended up getting basically no play in draft uh, it at all. It turned out it was really heinously bad in draft. Yeah. Because the decks that were good either had flyers or had a lot more synergy and ended up, you know, just kind of overpowering Broodhunter Worm. It was right. just so middle of the road. But if you took that approach, like what you were just saying, where you're like, well, I understand the draft format well, I'll play sealed with like some minor tweaks, you would ignore a card like Broodhunter Worm, which actually fine in sealed. If you yeah. had two or three of those, sure, I'll put two of them in my deck. And, you know, it did what you thought it would do before the format came out. <laughs> Broodhunter Worm reminds me of uh, Andrew Cuneo. He's a, an, another guest on the show. He had a very interesting episode. And, yeah. Uh, he, he challenged me to the Broodhunter Challenge yeah. room <laughs> before a, a sealed tournament which was, it was like me, him, and like Gabby, and he was like, hey, we have a Brood Hunter challenge where you take our, the total number of Brood Hunters you've played versus the, and, versus, and, and multiply like the total number of match wins you have. So, you, the, 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 and that's how many points you get. So you get more points the more Brood Hunters you play because he just thought the card was so bad. Oh, uh, that's amazing. So you got a, a positive modifier for playing lots of Brood Hunters. That's rounds. pretty good. Just because you're upping your, your difficulty rating. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's pretty good. But, but the, the, the point is that, in a synergy format, this very much non-synergy card was good and sealed and bad in draft. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to see that in Shadows where, you know, cards, like, we're going to talk about some of the cards that change the most, but even just cards like Thornhide Wolves or Gotstaff Arsonists, cards that don't really think much about for draft, it's playable, but that's about it, are, are cards you'll frequently play in sealed. Yep. Uh, let's talk about uh, something that's really important uh, when it comes to how to approach sealed deck, especially when you contrast it with draft, but in, is, in another especially is when you contrast it to other sets, which is the removal, right? And we've noted that for the booster draft format, the removal's quite slow. We've got a couple of five mana removal spells in Throttle and Reduced to Ashes. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, Sleep Paralysis at four mana at Sorcery Speed. I mean, it's an enchantment, but, you know, you're not instant speed blowing anybody out with that card either. And, you know, you and I have been pretty wary of those cards for the most part in draft. I'm a little higher on sleep paralysis than you, but whatever. Like, the, these cards are not exciting, and, and we're in agreement that you're much better off going for the cheaper, uh, more efficient options when it comes to being proactive, that kind of thing. Now, when we translate that over to sealed, it's kind of interesting because it carries over, right? I mean, it th these cards are very much in a similar role where it's not like, well, the sealed format's a little slower, so I'm happier to play a Throttle or a Reduced to Ashes. I'm still kind of equally not so thrilled to play these cards, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, I, I, I think that the, these removal spells do get better in sealed. Do you think so? Yeah, I'm a little happy Man, I'm that. always just like, but, eh. But regardless, I mean, even if you do end up, like, in sealed, you're going to play. Like, I think you're not going to leave Reduced to Ashes or Throttle or sleep. Definitely not Sleep Paralysis in their sideboard if you're in no. those colors. But what I think these are, these cards speak to more than that is how inefficient they are and how ineffective they are at dealing with a lot of the bombs of the format. Sure, like, and, and that, that's the reason why I don't have them that high. Like, I already have them as necessary evils in in draft, but like, if my opponent's going to play some six, seven, eight mana spell and I don't have an answer, like if I look at my five mana removal spell and it can't kill it, I just feel like I'm doing it wrong. That 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 is true. I mean, and, I know that I don't. It's not like I can like, well, I choose to play better removal. I'm not saying that I have a better option, but I want to almost like zig when they're zagging or try something well, different. I think this impacts more like what the bombs end up feeling like, yeah. like than it does what these removal spells end up feeling like. And what I mean by that is 
the removal spells, these are kind of bad. I'm not arguing that they're yeah, good. Yeah. So the bombs are a little more resilient, a little more important than they would be in a normal sealed format. Or, but you still play this removal because this removal is what you have. Because you still, that's all you've got. Um, I think an important comparison to make here as well is looking back to, well, you know, we're talking about Battle for Zenekar quite a bit, Oblivion Strike. Yeah, in Oath of the Gatewatch, you had Oblivion Strike in sorry, Isolation yeah. Zone mm-hmm. uh, at Common. And that actually made the texture of those sealed formats a lot different. In those formats, you could play a deck composed mostly of commons and uncommons and still feel decent about your chances because you could Oblivion Strike or Isolation Zone a lot of the cards you would lose to. I mean, if you had two Oblivion Strikes in your in your deck, th- there just weren't bombs that they could play that you didn't very that few. you were drawing dead I mean, to. There, there, yeah. there, there were a couple, but there were very, very few. Yeah. Know, there, there are not that many Sphinxes of the Final Word or whatever. Right. But here in, in Shadows of Instrad, because the common removal is largely ineffective at dealing with the the rares and mythics, it means that you should go more out of your way to play the rares and mythics. They're better relatively than they have been in other formats. Right. And that's a, a really important distinction to make just because it did feel like in those older in the in the last format, those Oblivion Strikes and Isolation Zones really did sort of even the field that it kind of didn't matter. Like you could open up some of the better bombs in the format and still lose them. And now, like if somebody plays a Soren, things very difficult to to answer. You yeah, know, if it, somebody plays an Olvenwald Hydra, even you know, your reduced to ashes doesn't kill it. I mean, even if someone plays a Wolf of Devil's Breach. Yeah, you know, your I mean, reduced to ashes kills it, but your, your throttle certainly. But doesn't. your throttle doesn't and, right. And th- and this also highlights why cards like Angelic Purge are so good. Yeah, Angelic Purge just kills everything. Yeah, and and you know, along that same lines. Talking about, we're going to talk about some of the colors here in a bit, but Angelic Purge and uh, Bound by Moon Silver, very high on my list. You know, oh, those yeah. draw me into white or at least splashing. And it's also of note that both of those cards are splashable as well. There's no double white in those mat, uh, well, casting costs. Speaking of splashes, mm-hmm. a lot of the times in this format you're going to be two colors, but you will often splash. Yeah. And uh, the ways that you should look to splash is, I very rarely will splash with no fixing. Like, I'm not really a big fan of the, like, 873 mana base. Uh, You're like, eight mountains, seven swamps, and three planes for my Angelic Purge and Bound by Moon Silver. I think you end up with a, a fairly a fairly poor mana base. On the other hand, if you have, uh, you know, like a woodland stream, the blue-green land, or, or something along those lines, you can end up splashing pretty easily if you have, like, one of those in a warped landscape, the colorless land that you pay two and tap and sacrifice it to get any land. That... That is actually pl- fairly playable and sealed, and it leads you down the path of playing three colors a little bit more often than you would. And when I say three colors, I mean like literally like you're playing two white cards in in, in your black blue deck or right. something along those lines. And if you're playing green, you also end up with a few options like Fork in the Road is quite playable. Uh, Vessel of Nascency helps I- I- to some degree. Well, Weirding Wood is is a card I-, I like quite a bit because it draws you a card and it can uh, fix your third color. So. Be open to splashing more than you would in draft. In draft, I, I generally lean against it unless you have a compelling reason and and some fixing. In sealed, I'm a lot more open to it just because if I open a Soren, I'm just going to be in my deck. Right. I, uh, I don't have to play white and black. I could just be playing black or white and then just playing the Soren as well. For sure. Uh, the other thing to keep your eye out on, there's a nice little opportunity for some value because there are a decent number of, of dual lands. And sometimes you get sad because you open up a dual land or two at, at, at Uncommon. And you can't, you're not splashing, you know, you look at your bomb and it's not in that color. But you should make sure that you keep your eye out as well for cards like Guy Blast, Veteran Cathar. These type of cards that have an activated ability or an additional bonus ability um, that you may play on your own. But if you can, you know, get white for your Veteran Cathar or blue for your Guy Blast, it does make them that much better. And maybe you play a Highland Lake, you know, to, you know, on the splash, if you will. Right, in you your play red a black Forsaken deck Sanctuary in your green black deck yeah. just to get Veteran Cathar going. Yeah, I mean, that is about as close as it gets to free. And that's a nice little addition that's not going to upset your mana base too much and could be the difference between a game win and a loss. It's just a place to keep your eye out for. When it comes to, you know, playing a Veteran Cathar and putting just like straight up planes in my deck, if I'm not playing white, I'm, I'm a lot less into that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really looking for that. Um, and along the same lines of what we were talking about earlier, Luis, too, with the uh, synergistic stuff, to get a little more granular on that, the build around me cards, and there are a million build arounds. And I, I have a feeling that like Wizards of the Coast R and D got together and just said like, how many build around me's can we put in this? It was a real feature of original Innistrad, and they've brought it back in a huge way. Mainly, these are enchantments, the ones that stand out the most. But there's plenty of creatures and other things that that would count in this camp as well. And they get kind of interesting because while they're not intrinsically worse by being in sealed, 
they fall in that same category of the synergy cards or the synergy interactions where you need to surround them with some core of cards. It doesn't have to be your whole entire deck, but you do need something to make them better. You know, call card like Call the Bloodline, these type of cards that really go off if you have madness cards or ways to recur cards. And if you don't get those, they're probably going to be in your sideboard. So the, the key here is knowing kind of what the thresholds are for each of these cards and yeah. and, and how to like evaluate so, them. So let's, I'll throw one at you. Call the Bloodline. So for, if, for me to play Call the Bloodline, I would need one Sanitarium Skeleton and like one or two Madness cards. And because it's because it's close enough on on its own, right? Maybe some other synergies. If you have delirium, it gets a little bit more appealing. If you have like a ghoul steed or something along those lines, it gets a little bit more appealing. But I'm really looking for a a, a, a big meaty synergy like sanitarium skeleton. There's not actually a lot of meat on sanitarium skeleton, but it's mostly pretty skeletal. Uh, <laughs> Bad example. <laughs> yeah, uh, another one I, I I I like in draft is groundskeeper plus call the bloodline, but. In order to justify putting Groundskeeper in my deck, I'll need a little bit more than Call. And this is why Sealed it gets a little trickier. Because yeah. in draft, you can like, well, I'll wheel Groundskeeper. I've got two green vessels. You know, I'm looking to, to, to get Crawling Sensation Groundskeeper going. And then now Call the Bloodline becomes good in this deck. In Sealed, it's like, well, if I have Call the Bloodline, I do kind of want to play this Groundskeeper so I can play both. But I need I need another one or two cards. And sometimes you'll have them. Sometimes you will have a, a Vessel of Nascency and a Crawling Sensation. And you have this whole engine that works together. Sometimes you won't. And I don't believe it's correct to play Call the Bloodline plus Groundskeeper with no other synergies for those two cards. Okay, um, I'll throw another one at you. What about something like, you know, one of the green, like Elven Wall Mysteries or a Crawling Well, Mysteries is, is, is an interesting example where that I think is fantastic and sealed, and all it takes is having like 12 or 13 creatures. Right. Ideally, ideally, like 14 or 15, but even with like 13 or 12 creatures, I, I would be pretty happy playing Old World Mysteries in my deck. The card is just so amazing in a long game. What about Crawling Sensation then? A little, that, that one's a little, little trickier. Without yeah. Epitaph Golem, I'm less happy about it because in a se- long sealed game, it's just you're not really going to be able to just keep using it, especially if you if you end up milling a bunch of cards. I mean, a card like Seasons Past also it, you know works with that. I guess that's a Mythic Rare, so it's not going to happen all sure. that often. Sure. Um, Another, but what are you looking for, you know, when it comes to crawling sensation? I'm you, looking you for mostly epitaph golem. You want to know golem. what the threshold is. Yeah. Is it epitaph golem? Full stop. It's epitaph golem or seasons past or ever after. Basically, a way to to not deck yourself. Okay. With a green vessel being a kind of like if you have two green vessels, a crawling sensation, and a groundskeeper, that's that's getting interesting. At okay. That point. And then I would look to again combine it with other discard cards for for value. Yeah, but it's interesting, right? Because each of these has had sort of a different threshold level some involve common some involve uncommons or another rare to let's, make it let's work let's work our way down the notable builder rounds. Uh, trail uh-huh. of mystery is a card i would consider not playable uh you have to have tons of instants and sorceries which card are you talking about this is uh, every time you play an instance or sorcery uh, investigate yeah Fortuna that's of trail of mystery is the one from two sets ago right uh trail of i think that i, I think, think trail of mystery is the morph well this is two in a blue it's uh you don't know the computer. Trail of Investigation. <laughs> uh, figure it out. But it's Tuna Blue. It's Trail of Evidence. Oh, Trail of Evidence. Yeah, Mystery is the yeah. one in a green. Yeah, Yeah. so this is uh, Tuna Blue and whatever you play. <laughs> You're the one on the computer. Yeah, I do have a computer in I'm front of me. I'm just literally lying on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> Pontificating. <laughs> but this one I don't like because I, I you just never have enough instants or sorceries. And it takes tons of time, whereas like Olvenwald Mysteries, for example... Uh, uh, speaking of mysteries, uh, does stabilize you because it gives you a bunch of one-ones to chump with. Uh, so I don't really like Trail of Mysteries. Ongoing investigation, the only threshold is having creatures and having green mana. You mm-hmm. don't need both. If you have green mana, then you can be a little bit more creature light, though you still want a lot of creatures. If you don't have green mana, you need a lot of creatures with evasion to, to make it good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have things like Pyrehound and Rise from the Tides, which... Again, take a ten to twelve spell, you know, spells or more, which is hard, hard to get unlikely. that kind of spell yeah. density. But that's what you would need. Yeah, like if you open up well, that pool, Pyre Hound, I'd play with it. like seven or eight spells because that card you only need to play a one spell and it's fine. Mm-hmm. But if, for, to play Rise from the Tides, I would want at least eight or nine spells and probably closer to ten to twelve, and ideally more. Yeah. I mean, you need to, you need to reliably make three to four zombies in order to in order to have this card be a success. So th- those are a lot of the different build arounds that have different values like I, I like taking some of these cards early in draft and sealed you just have to look and see if you you hit these thresholds to be good right and it's interesting because like you said you know if, if you're booster drafting you know how to prioritize these things you can work towards those goals here it's a matter of knowing the thresholds and you know Luis did a rough breakdown of each of those and they're abstract 
Like some of them you called for some amount of creatures, just full stop creatures. Some of them you called for some specific uncommons or rares to go with these cards. And some of them were somewhere in between. You need X a number of spells, right? Like E means instants and sorceries, of course. And so, you know, this is a pretty deep sealed format in the sense that you could ignore those. It wouldn't kill you if you just ignored the build arounds but on the sealed pool where you do open up those pieces you're giving up value like you're just straight up missing out on what could be a really powerful interaction in your deck yeah and then, then you when you look at cards like uh halpak resurgence or Stencia masquerade that require a ton of the same creature type i've never seen these cards be good and sealed i haven't it's, yet it's just hard that you can't get the like 10 werewolves you want to make halpak resurgence good yeah that's exactly it. i mean you're you're often limited to six <laughs> you know and even then you're gonna get so cards that do get better in sealed are the seven or eight mana bombs or the really slow ones because i'm pretty off of these in, yeah, in right draft. exactly so you have cards like tamio's journal angel deliverance behold the beyond i've had very good experiences with behold the beyond specifically that's the the five black five black black, black discard your hand tutor for three cards look through your deck and get three cards yeah and the reason is if you just cast this on a stable board, you're a heavy favorite to win you the game. You just next can't time. lose, right? But in sealed, you're just more likely to have a board like this occur. So, yeah. it, and to get to the mana, it's just like ticking up a mana or two above what you'd be th- find acceptable in draft. I think you end up in that place in sealed. Uh, what about so along the same lines? What about uh, win conditions? What do those look like here? Because, you know, we talked about these synergistic combos, these two to three card combos that we put together in Booster Draft. And since we outlined the fact that these don't as often come together, what do win conditions look like for Sealed? So win conditions for Sealed... Because the uh, seven, eight drops are part of the equation. Cer- certainly part of the equation. You, you you want cards like that. You know, Nefalia Moondrakes can close out games. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, Flyers in general are just still good and Sealed. They're yeah. pretty, pretty classically good and Sealed. But even a card like, you know, I was talking about Nimbus of Dusk earlier in the Cracker Pack... Fine card and sealed. I would, I would pretty much always play it. Uh, so like the 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 flyers that can end the game are quite good. Uh, synergies that can end the game are quite good. So like uh, having a powerful engine like the epitaph golem with a way to mill yourself, or like even just Olvenwald mysteries by itself. Even uh, cards like equipment like True Faith Sensor, Ashmouth Blade, uh, or Neglected Heirloom are very very Slayer's good. Slayer's Plague. Uh, Slayer's Plate's great. Mm-hmm. These these are cards that just give you value over time, but also give you enough power to just actually close out the game ideally you have these like rare bombs these expensive rare bombs yeah. but not every sealed deck is going to have those so you do have to adjust for for when you don't and that that's where like the uncommon engines tend to work and you know if you have enough removal you can end the game with just random like five and six drops keswick dire swan does attack for damage for sure i find that the 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 other way that this expresses itself is with a lot of card advantage where maybe you don't have the particular powerful bomb that you hope or the card draw engine or whatever or you know the the board state engine but if you do find yourself in a situation where you know you have a tireless tracker that goes unchecked for multiple turns or whatever, just simply outcarding your opponent usually will get the job done. Now, if your whole entire deck is built just to make the game go longer, then you're just going to draw more cards that accomplish that goal, and it can be difficult to close out. But like you said, this is where commons like Dire Swine come in and are good enough. Like They do get the job done if you're just straight up outcarding your opponent by a lot. But you do need to put them in your deck you know, to make that work. Yeah, you you do have to have Which some. They're some, overlookable. Some yeah. some thought of, of doing that, and yeah. uh, you know, a more crit necropod will, will will finish games quite effectively. Um, colors. So here's the colors that I've been playing the most of: black, white, and green, and then blue, and then red is the color I've played the least. Yeah, Obzon um, Obzon certainly is at the top of the heap. Yeah, those are the the colors that I keep going to, and I think that part of it is because, like you said, like you open up a Soren, and I'm like, well, I'm playing the Soren, and that often ends up being green paired with half of Soren's color and then splashing for the other half. That happens all the time with a whole bunch of different cards. Also, I'll be green-black often and splash okay, for a second, white. I thought your argument was that we, these are the best colors because Soren's in those colors. <laughs> no. And you always open Soren. No, I just mean that, like... I would like to always open Soren. Like, if I place, if I open a Soren, this, these are the three colors that are making me most likely to, to play it. I'll splash for, for part of it. Or if I'm just white-black. I guess that's the thing, but I don't think that's happened to me much. But, um, you know, it, it does pop up pretty often that I do want to splash a color and then green helps me do that. The most, it also just seems to be, I think, the deepest color, green. Oh, I, green's the, the best and deepest color is in it? draft and it is in sealed as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I had that vibe. I don't know that it's like, 
green and then everything else is far behind it. But I definitely find myself yeah. gravitating. It's towards not it. not not by a landslide, but if you had to rank the colors, I think you would rank green first. Yeah, I think so too. Now the red and blue is interesting to me because I do play some blue. I do. I'll, I'll I'll get in there, but like the red blue deck specifically, I don't think I've played yet in sealed mm. well the, the red blue deck where you just have red and blue and a bunch of spells matters and yeah, stuff that yeah that, i haven't happen. seen that really come together yeah uh i think blue is pretty bad in sealed okay uh, there, there it has some cards i like and you know every now and then you will end up playing it uh, I, I have played it in some sealed but in general the problem i have with blue is that it's best common stitch mangler is a tempo card yeah uh just the wind another one of its better commons is also a tempo card it just you you aren't building decks that take advantage of this, and blue is pretty high on the list of like specific synergy decks, mm-hmm. so which just don't come together in sealed very often. Actually, uh, speaking of streamers, that it would help us prepare for this. Uh, Michael Jacob, I was talking to him about sealed, and he said blue in sealed in Shadows of Innistrad is worse than green in draft in Battle for Zendikar. Oh, really? He yeah, said he that? brought up that unprompted comparison. He, wow. He just thinks that blue is wildly unplayable in sealed. Yeah, I, I've had a, a hard time with red as well. It has some highlights. Uh, you know that you can the, the red removal spells are quite strong, uh, even in sealed they they certainly hold up. But a lot of the creatures are not. You know your blood mad vampires really don't look that great in sealed. Um, and then you know a lot of the cards that we don't even play in draft don't tend to translate over the brutes and those type of things don't. You know they don't get it magically better because we're in sealed. And I just find it hard to make like it it keeps pushing me towards this aggressive bend and I can't. I can't seem to make that work. Well, right. You, you have cards like Insolent Neonate and Senseless Rage that just don't really fit in, in Sealed no. very much. So I don't end up playing it. But like you said, I, I do end up playing mainly black, green, and white in some combination. And I usually try to stick to two colors with a splash, but I'll often splash. We mentioned it off the top, but I find myself splashing most of the time. Well, that's a function of, I, I think white, green is specifically the most common com- com- combination mm. in Sealed. And green something is is the most common is, is overall the most common green just helps to splash very easily yeah green has multiple commons that can can lead you down that path um when it comes to some of the mechanics for the set delirium delirium is by far the best mechanic. you can just do delirium and sealed right well not only can you just like naturally get there because the games are longer or at least you have a higher chance of getting there you also uh, a lot of the delirium cards just ain't, uh, lend themselves very well to yeah. a late game you know, playing Toppelgeist or Kindly Stranger are just very strong cards. Yeah, the these are just, just good cards. You also just want cards like Vessel of Nascency in your deck. You're not really, like, giving up much by playing that card. In fact, mm-hmm. that card is good. So Delirium is a, is a kind of mechanic that naturally lends itself to sealed the way that sealed games work. Right, and, and some of the mechanics, you know, one of them that I was thinking of is Madness doesn't, right? I mean, exactly. sometimes you get it, but, it you know, it, it's just very, very pool-dependent. doesn't fit into the natural cadence of of uh of sealed deck i mean i like you said you know if if you pick up a call of the bloodline and you have a couple of madness cards hey you can get value it's it's not like you're going to turn that down it just doesn't seem to you know go particularly well with the way that sealed deck plays out you are nodding to me now i'm agreeing with you okay <laughs> it doesn't carry well, over what, what, one of the strengths of, of recording the show live and this is uh, something we're going to push to do because we're at a lot of the same grand prix yeah you know is, is that uh non-verbal communication is a really big positive <laughs> yeah you podcast. think that that's a great thing <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm waiting for you to give me the thumbs up when i make a, a great point yeah like... well i haven't had cause to do that uh, <laughs> and, and i don't I, said e- I'm I, waiting. Don't, I don't expect to, to have cause to do that in any future podcast L- let's take a look at some of the cards um, that go up and da- up or and or down. Excuse me, up or down significantly in value. Thank you. <laughs> well, I got the thumbs up. <laughs> that was. I genuine. agree with the direction you're taking the show, which is towards single Talking card about cards. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the cards, you know, when we talk about the difference between draft and sealed, a lot of them carry over, but a lot of them don't. There are definitely cards that you would see. And say and maybe get excited about because you think, oh, that card's great in booster draft, but it's actually not that great in sealed. And, and the same is the opposite. The opposite's true as well, where it's a card you might ignore in booster draft, but you see it in your sealed pool, and you should give it more attention. So I've pulled a, a few um, from a list that you, Kenji, and I came up with earlier today. Um, one of them is Humble the Brute. Humble the Brute. So this is the four and a white destroy a creature with power four or greater and investigate. It's yeah, an and I, I tend to leave that in the sideboard in draft, but I'm very willing to bring it in. 
if I see you know multiple targets or if I think it's going to be good. But it's on that borderline for me, 23rd, 24th, 25th card, and I'll usually end up leaving it in the board and then boarding it when I think it's going to be good. But I do think it jumps that fence when it comes to sealed where I think it is a little bit better to go ahead and main deck it because people are almost always going to be playing targets for it. And it's very good if you find a target for it. Uh, and then if I feel like, okay, this is not going to be a matchup where I'm going to be able to resolve or, you know, get this spell off for, to actually hit anything, then I'll take it out. But that's a fine line, but it's an important one. I would lean towards main decking it. it, yeah. it just most, most of the people you're playing against will have multiple targets for it. And not only will they have multiple targets, those targets will be the high-value creatures. I mean, it kills big creatures. It's the right. kind of card... Like, this is the kind of card that can kill a lot of the bombs people are, are playing or even splashing for. Yeah, and if you get to kill something big with it, I mean, that is a nasty two-for-one. It's really good. Um, we've talked about it a couple times, but Call the Bloodline. You know, this is a card that you can pick up early in booster draft and start really dedicating picks to abusing it. And there's a lot of ways to abuse it. The best way uh, generally is with madness cards, but you can also include different recursion elements from your graveyard. You mentioned Groundskeeper and Sanitarium Skeleton as two of the, the main ones. But as we mentioned before, that's not going to pop up as often. So Call the Bloodline actually gets a bit worse in Sealed because you need to just kind of get lucky and get those pieces. And while opening up a Call the Bloodline is kind of exciting in Booster Draft because you've got three packs ahead of you basically in which to find the pieces that work, uh, it's not so in Sealed. They're either there or they're not. So it, to me, it's like the kind of card that you look at and then you've got a checklist of these these recursion cards or madness cards. And, you know, if you hit a couple of them, then go for it. But if you don't, you know, you're not jamming Call the Bloodline just because it happens to be pretty good in booster draft. Yep, exactly. Um, Drog Skull Cavalry is one that I'm definitely impressed by in Sealed, where in booster draft, I think it is playable with the right deck, but any seven, seven mana creature is a pretty tough sell, um, especially when it does die to some of this junkier common removal that we talked about. But that said... This is a very good late game card for sealed deck because you're going to get seven mana more often and the card is unreal when it goes unchecked. I mean, this thing, it can dig you back from a very, very deep hole and even put you back ahead uh, pretty quickly once you get rolling with it. Yeah, this is a card I would prioritize playing. Like this, this, yeah. and, and it's again, a bomb. You know, there, there are a lot of cards which have similar value between uh, draft and seal. Arcane Drive is in 10 out of 10 in both. Yeah, you know, surprise. T- turns out. But, yeah. you know, Wolf of Devil's Breach, just a great card. But Drog Soul Cavalry goes from, yeah, I'd say like around a C to C plus to C minus in, in draft to pretty close to an A in seal where you just B want, plus, you yeah. want this card in your deck. Yeah, totally. And I've seen this card just turn around some insane games. Um, Another one that I like, I actually like in both, uh, I'll be honest, but but I do like it much more in Sealed, which is Confirm Suspicions. That's the three boo-boo counterspell, and you investigate three times. You know, I do play that card in Booster Draft as well, just because I think it's such a high upside, but it it's not perfect. It, it is a clunker. Uh, you have to leave up a heck of a lot of mana, and you kind of have to counter the first thing they throw at it, because you can't just keep passing you know, unless you're, you're significantly. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a spell resolve where I could cast confirm suspicion. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it it's didn't just matter. The rules. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like turn eight village messenger. You're like no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but it's just such a such a big swing when you do get to counter anything because of the clues. But in sealed deck, you know, counters do tend to go up in value, and while confirm suspicion still costs five and isn't amazing, um, you're often going to be able to set up a scenario where the board's relatively stable and you get to counter something pretty powerful from your, from your opponent. And if you do that, it is very tough for them to come back. You're going to be, you're going to be in great position with those three uh, clues. Yeah, Confirmed Suspicions is, is great in Sealed, and I think decent in Draft, but a pretty big difference. Um, another one that is kind of interesting in Sealed is uh, Manic Scribe. Yeah, and, and, it goes up a little, right? And Start of the Wake. I'm going to lump these two together because okay. they're both mill cards. Uh-huh. Where... I actually thought Star Lord was going to be pretty good in draft, and I think it's kind of wildly unplayable now. I, I don't like it at all. <laughs> I, 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 I've just had really bad experiences playing with it and really good experiences playing against it, where your opponent taps four mana and puts a card in the graveyard. And yeah, no you kind of hold your breath like, oh, this could be bad, and then you're like, oh, never mind. Yeah, but in you Sealed, nothing. with the game being slower, I Startled Awake is actively good, and Manic Scribe is... I wouldn't say Manic Scribe is universally good, but if you have a deck capable of achieving Delirium, Manic Scribe this is the O3 that mills them for three, then Delirium just does it every turn. This is a pretty fast clock. Yeah. And and you can actually build a deck where this is one of the win conditions. Yeah, I, I just like the fact that it just sort of passively sits there. It doesn't have to enter combat. And it is a win con. Like, your opponent, if the board is stalled, just has to deal with it. Now, they often can, but I like cards that force my opponent to have something. 
And uh, Manic Scribe kind of does that more often than it does in Sealed. It's kind of cool. Another card I've actually had some pretty decent luck with is Nephalia Moondrakes. Um, I do think it's significantly better in Sealed than in Draft. I still don't think it's great. Um, but one thing that I really do appreciate appreciate about the Moon Drakes is that you're going to cast it more often in Sealed. It costs 7 mana, it's 5-5 five, five with flying. When it enters the battlefield, you get to give one of your creatures flying until end of turn. That's all fine, fine and good, cool. It is a 5-5 five, five flyer, they do have to deal with it. If they do, that ability, the pay 6 mana, exile it from your graveyard and all your creatures get flying until end of turn, can absolutely be a game winner. You find yourself in a, in a stalled out board state a lot more often in sealed deck and this is a kind of card that if your opponent you know doesn't see it coming if you can discard it if they kill it and don't think about it or if they just can't do anything about it straight up you can just get a win off of it you just send your team to the sky they can't block and, and you can kill them in one shot and that's powerful it's got a lot of relevant text yeah and you know you wouldn't expect it because i think this card pretty unplayable in draft but yeah i don't like it in draft that much sealed. yeah uh rise from the tides yeah we, we talked about this earlier mm. if you don't have the threshold of you know Realistically, like nine or ten spells, this card's pretty bad. And, yeah. and so, I, I, for the most part, I think this is going to be riding the sideboard. Yep. Uh, what about Vessel of Malignity? This, this, this the, is a mind rot. Yeah, right? it's a black vessel that makes them exile two cards out of their hand. Yeah, two to cast, I, two to pop it. I've played this card multiple times in sealed and been happy with and it. And you've been happy I, with I would, it. I think I would always main deck the first and maybe even the second. Okay, so I know that a lot of people really like playing, we call these mind rot effects, cards that make your opponent get rid of two cards from their hand. Um, how do you. Normally, these cost three mana. Right. How do you compare this one to it? You're paying four mana total, but you get the installment plan. Is that better or worse? Like, how do, how do you see it's that? it's overall worse. It's worse. Part of the reason is that you don't really want to play a Vessel of Malignity before you use it because then the, the, your opponent's like, oh, you've got that in play? Or I guess I'll hold this land. Or, you know, I guess I'll try to structure my game so my best two cards aren't my last two cards. So frequently, you're going to want to play and use this in the same turn, which does just make it a little bit more awkward. So I'd rather just have a Mind Rot... The upside is this does add to your delirium counts, and, and I found that that's pretty useful. And then it also uh, does exile, so there, are, you know, more than just a classic mind rot, it gets around some of the the graveyard recursion effects. Okay, um, <laughs> weirding wood. Uh, like you I like this card before, a lot. I, I like weirding right? wood. If you have I a third, if you have a third color, it's great. If you even have two colors but have a high end, I think it's still good. I mean, this helps you cast seven drops. It it ramps you, it fixes you, and you get your card back. Yeah, it, it's a lot better than it looked on first blush. Uh, this last one is a, a a card which you took some con, convinc, convincing on here. Uh, magnifying yeah, glass. You're still working on me on that. Three one. mana. You know, taps for a colorless, and you can pay four and tap and investigate. You know, both me and Kenji were telling how great this card was. Well, Kenji was laughing when he said it. Well, he did say he liked he did, it in he draft, He wasn't too. like, oh, no, it's very good. Yeah, he said he likes it in draft, and I think it's reprehensible in draft. I don't like it in draft all what, that though, much. I have it in my current sealed draft league on Magic Online because you made me put it in the deck. And sealed I, draft league? Uh, excuse me, sealed league on Magic Online. And uh, it's in my, it's in my it's deck right now. it's been great so far. It's won you two matches. I've played one game, and I lost it. Or one match, and I lost it. Well, yeah. But I didn't draw the it's magnifying going to win you glass, so matches. inconclusive. So the thing about magnifying glass is, you know, we've talked about how finishers are better, how you want to play the seven drops. Well, it helps you cast them. It also, on a stalled board, does it slowly, I will admit slowly, but it does draw you extra cards. Okay. I mean, is it, ex like, you know, we talked about inevitability, card draw engines, win conditions. Yeah, like, are you it's, putting it's, it in? It's all those don't, one. <laughs> are you seriously putting it in that camp? Isn't it too slow to count that? Or I wouldn't call it a win condition. I think that's an exaggeration. I mean, so these, I, I think you're overselling this... it here. But... Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get to be the, the the magnifying glass salesman here? That's not a very lucrative pretend. No, I actually. think I'm getting out of the business. Uh, but I, I do think if you're a deck that can use the sixth and seventh mana, so you you want an artifact mm -hmm. that taps for mana, and you know, anticipates having some amount of board stalls. I, I think if you put magnifying glass in all your sealed decks, you'll overall be happier than if you didn't. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, a couple cards out. I want to mention too. Uh, Broken Concentration, the one blue blue counter spell. With yep. Madness 4, which I've never seen happen. Mm -hmm. And um, Pick the Brain are both cards that I don't mind main decking, even though I would never do that in draft, or at least rarely do that in draft. Another card which I've found is a pretty good sideboard card is Deny Reality, the two and a blue counter a creature and exile it. Mm -hmm. 
you can main deck this card. It's not that a disaster if you do, but I really like it. Once you've seen that your opponent has like, you know, what if they they have Ovenwald, Hydra, and Drogs, Cold Cavalry as two of their high end cards? Then Deny Reality start looking pretty good. Yeah, it does. It just it, it deals with their good expensive cards in a way that's pretty clean. So uh, Deny Reality is a, is a fine card to to sideboard in. The, the the trouble, of course, with both Deny Reality and Broken Concentration is that they're blue, so you're not going to end up in that position all yeah. that often. Yeah, especially Broken Concentration being double blue. Yeah. Um. Pick the brain? Yeah. I, I, again, I do think a, the card is fine. Okay. Um, good. So that's what we had for the main points. I mean, I, I think that, you know, th- this this sealed format, and I'm, we're going to go over the takeaways here in just a second, but just to sort of set the stage on the big picture, it is kind of interesting because this sealed format's weird. Um, on one hand, you need to understand the big picture things like uh, the fact that it's slower, that, that's pretty universal of, of sealed, but also these synergy differences and you need to understand that you're not going to hit the same type of decks like this sealed decks are going to look a lot different than the decks that you play in booster draft a lot different not that the sealed decks are like slightly worse versions or you know a little more cobbled together they're just way different builds when you compare them but then you also need to go super granular on this stuff where you have to know like what you broke down for us, Luis, which I thought was really useful, which is here's the build around me on commons. Here's a rough threshold that you want to hit before you're going to put this in your deck. You need to just know that for all of the build around me on commons because, again, these are some of the more powerful cards in the set. And if you're leaving those on the table because you say, it's sealed, I can't play them, or if you're jamming them in your deck because you say, it's blank, it's just a sweet card, you're, you're missing out on value one way or the other. And you need to find out where that equilibrium is for you know, for each of these cards. You're going to get a pretty big edge, I think, if you can do that. Um, Colors-wise? Colors-wise, uh, green, I believe, is the clear winner. Mm. Uh, white, I like second because Angelic Purge is such a good card in Sealed. And because cards like Dauntless Cathar are just solid amounts of value. You, you, you just have a lot of pretty solid commons that, that work out well in the context of Sealed. It also enables uh, True Faith Sensor, which I think is one of the one of the better cards to go along. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I forgot, so we'll continue to take away in a second, but there was another grouping of cards that I meant to ask you about actually earlier today, um, and I'll ask you about them now, which are combat tricks. Oh, We've right. seen a, a rise in value in those, uh, and you know, people will play four, five, six combat tricks in their really aggressive decks. Um, are, are these, since you can get them, right? They're, they're everywhere in sealed too. Uh, do they fall in that same category about the synergy stuff, or do you still run these in sealed? I don't love them in sealed. People tend to have more removal spells. You, you, you're using up your spell slots with cards like, you know, Vessel of Malignity and, and, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, totally different take. I, I, especially since people are also more likely to play like four fives and five fours and and that that sort of thing. Six and a six sixes. So combat tricks with three threes is just not a good combination. So I, I would steer away from combat tricks, though. I do like Survive the Night because it is a two for one. This is the plus one plus zero indestructible uh, combat trick for three. And the fact that it's slightly more expensive is not as big of a deal, whereas it, it, the fact that it is more powerful is, is upside. Yeah, it is a good card. Yeah. I mean, I've always read it as a good card, and I've always just felt like it was uh, one mana too expensive to be playable. But if you slow everything else down, then it gets relatively less. Right. And, and to be clear, we're not saying that sealed is super slow you can always just play your magnifying glasses and your nephalia moon drakes you do have to put in cards that keep you from dying and this is why i like cards like mold graph scavenger because it's a zero four early and a three four late and that's just a good split card but even then you know cold wolf's a fine card yeah like you you should play your, your rancid rats you should play you, even stitch mangler i think is a playable card even though i don't i don't love the fact that it's a little weaker and sealed. You just can't ignore the board. It's just you need a, a good late game plan. Yeah, and you know, I think that, that that goes to some of the cards that we picked that had the biggest difference. You know, a lot of the cards that we didn't don't. A lot of them are just solid cards that if you're in these colors, you're going to play these cards. Like you said, like your Quilled Wolves and your Green deck are basically always making the cut. And uh, and you can just proceed proceed as normal. I, I actually tend to value those type of cards really highly because you do a face, you do sometimes face uh, good curve outs. I wouldn't say that you face a ton of like amazing ag- aggressive decks in sealed, but sometimes people just play a two or three and a four drop on you, and you do need to interact with that. Like you, you can't be you know casting weirding wood into magnifying glass or whatever and hoping to survive. You're going to take a ton of damage before that happens. And cards like Quilled Wolf and and you know Graph Mole and these type of things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do the show in the same room. What are you talking about? <laughs> you, are you awake? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to your thrilling <laughs> monologue. <laughs> your martial log. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's something different. We need a camera for that. Uh, anyway, big picture stuff. It's slower. The synergies are going to be less important, but make sure you study up on knowing when the synergies do work in your sealed pool. Green, black, and white seem to be the three strongest colors. Uh, red and blue are down the line a little bit, but none of them are unplayable. Um, you know, if, if you get enough playables in, in each, go ahead and, and, and put together your deck. Don't be afraid to splash. Splashing's good. Make sure you have a long game plan. Uh, it can either be through expensive and powerful spells or through some type of inevitability or through a card draw engine, meaning that it's repeatable. You can keep drawing more and more cards off of it. All of these can lead you to victory, but you do need to consider them if you you know, pack your pack your list full of a bunch of defensive creatures and don't ever have a way to actually win the game, you're going to have a hard time against uh, the bombs because you're probably just not going to have enough answers for the bombs. Yeah, kind of in summary, this sealed format is relatively close to the sealed formats we've come to expect. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's useful to look at uh, the, you know, the, the cards that change in value. It's useful yeah. to look at the different build arounds and how those change. But the biggest shift is... As much of a synergy format as, as set of Shadows over Innistrad is in draft, it's just not really there in Sealed. Yeah, and, that's the big gap, right? Yeah. And, and if you've mastered the Delirium deck, you're in good shape because I think that's the, 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 the I think that's the most common kind of deck in Sealed as well. Yeah. But if so, you've spent a lot of time getting good at red-black vampires, I have bad news. Right, right. And, and, and even though this Sealed format does seem fairly typical as far as Sealed formats go, I think it's a very good idea to to check in to make sure that this is kind of where we're at and, and okay, this is what we've found so far playing. Okay. Uh, one last question before we sign off. Do you like it? Are you enjoying Sealed? I'd rather just do Draft. I, I, yeah. I, I don't particularly like the Sealed format. Yeah, I haven't found it particularly enjoyable either. Not not that it's bad. I, I wouldn't say anything bad about it, but it kind of feels like the same format minus the cool stuff. Yeah, that the, the, like, stuff, the, the stuff, stuff that I like, I like doing to do draft. is like... Well, also, not... also, one of the points we talked about earlier where instead of Oblivion Strike, we have, you know, Throttle. Like, when your opponent plays a 6-6 six, six or, or a 5-5 five, five Flyer... You just die to it a lot of the time. Yeah. The, the, the rares are so dominating and sealed, whereas in, in draft, there's just a lot more you can do. You can overpower them with synergies and, you know, or potentially aggression, whereas those options aren't available to you in sealed. So, uh, you know, I've, I've lost to enough rares in sealed that I'm just like, all right, well, this is cool. I'd rather just do a draft. Retreat so back to your... If, if you enjoy sealed, by all means, play sealed. But uh, in, in this particular format, I, I prefer draft, whereas I think for... Oath of the Gate Watch, uh, the sealed format was really good. It was. And great. I, and I played I, so many yeah. of those leagues. It also because leagues were new, but I played a. Yeah, ton but of even those. then, like having Oblivion Strike and Isolation Zone and Blinding Drone is like as these common answers just made, meant that the gameplay was really good. Yeah, this is this is definitely something that I'm gonna that we're gonna talk about on the Sunset Show for Shadows when that comes up because this was a, a definitely a big difference with the removal. All right, well let's talk, let's call it a show here. I want to remind you that. Limited Resources is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. You can go there to get sealed product. Uh, you can get singles. I mentioned it uh, at the top of the show, but we do have uh, Limited Resources sleeves and deck boxes. You can let your value flag fly and uh, and go get those and, and you know show everybody at your local shop how you roll. Um, really excited to have those back in stock, by the way. The, the, it's not easy to get those things done, and, and CFB really helped out a lot. So thank you to them for that. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR, and Luis is LSV. You can uh, find everything related to the podcast uh, at LRcast.com, including a link to our YouTube channel where you can find our depth check videos. I'm starting to work up the one for Shadows Over Innistrad. Uh, now you can find the Marshall Log blog cliff on the YouTube channel there as well if you want something a little... Well, a little less serious than our than our normal fare. Yeah, we're um, we're incredibly serious. It's just all business here. <laughs> you say that from the bad ear hairs going everywhere. You look <laughs> like a crazy man. Um, anyway, thanks for hanging out with us uh, this week, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. For the sign off this week, we uh, take a minute to get some bad beat stories from our friends Rashad Miller and David Ochoa. Right, are you ready? Rashad Miller so I sit down for my draft my opponent sits down you know sits down flicks his hair to the side looks at his fancy watch so you know this is like this this, this is some you know I'm not I'm not going to use words to describe this person I play a turn two spirit of the labyrinth and then he taps three mana and plays what's the card Read the bones, read the bones. Plays read the bones, and I'm just licking my lips. So now I know it's just, this guy's just a donkey. He plays read the bones into my spirit of the labyrinth. 
pays three mana and two life to scry two. As soon as he draw, tries to draw the card, I'm like, uh, uh, uh. Well, anyway, I set up this beautiful play where I break a stalemate by monstrousing my Colossus of Akros and putting a Eidolon, a hopeful Eidolon on it. Break the stalemate. I'm up to like 200 life. Get him down to like three or two life. Top Dex Kiora, obviously he has a mythic. Top Dex Kiora stops me from attacking, but I'm like, surely I'll deck him. Top Dex Vortex Elemental. <laughs> so now I can't deck him. Don't get to my answers to Kiora. The game drags on long enough for him to get two emblems on his Kiora, and then he finally beats me where I'm two cards away from coming back. That's a bad beat. That's a good beat. <laughs> All right, so my bad beat story. Hi, uh, this is David Ochoa, and my bad beat story, the most recent one at least, because, you know, it's just a plethora, like unending cornucopia of them. So I'm on my way to Houston for the Grand Prix, and I've looked at the, all these places that I want to get food at, and as it turns out, there is not too many barbecue places that are nearby, but I find one that looks okay, and I notice after reading a few Yelp reviews, which, goodness, I don't do very often, but it's good to get some information, is that they have beef ribs on Friday, which are by far my most favorite of all barbecue delicacies. So I get there, and I see them. They're like giant tomahawks, just dinosaur bones. And my eyes just, like, dilate. I'm salivating. I'm like, it's completely Pavlovian. And the two people ahead of me grab the last two. That's it. They were out. It's like 2 p.m. They or they opened up an hour earlier. Oh no! And they're gone right there. I can see them weighing on the scale, just like glistening. Oh my gosh! And I can't have it. Like, I'll, I'll take one of those. Oh, you mean that one that she ordered? That was the last one. Sorry, kid. <laughs> and that was it. But thankfully, their barbecue was great, and I ate it all, every single meal that I was here. Do you think you'll have a chance to get uh, a beef rib before you leave? Oh, no, they closed. I, I actually... This is unreal. This, this is actually unreal. I, my opponent did not show up in the second to last round. And through using various sundials, I calculated I have just enough time to run over there, get food, and run back and eat it in front of everyone else. I mean, in a corner and be very completely delighted, which I did. It was great. You can check Twitter and for all those beautiful posts.